All right, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, just to give a brief info uh, intro on, on us, we're the Oxford Society of Aging and Longevity that's hosting this event. Um, we are the Center for Education, Advocacy, and Research at the University of Oxford around longevity. Uh, not only do we do events around the frontline science of longevity, but we also talk about how longevity is changing many different aspects of life, socially, politically, economically. Um, this event definitely falls into that category where we're going to be talking about age, ageism, changing definitions of ageism, and how that's kind of permeating through um, our contemporary discourse with really two thought leaders in the space that are that are that are paving the way in, in different ways. Um, and they're and they're going to give um, some some more background on themselves. Um, just to say, uh, as I say in all of our talks, if if you're interested in longevity um, and you want to get part of the society or you want to find a way to engage, please add me on LinkedIn. Um, I would be very happy to help guide you. Um, and we're 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 a great um, organization. I highly recommend joining. I was one of you. Uh, years ago when I joined as a student, uh, and now as the president, I'd love to welcome you guys to join our society. So um, really quickly, uh, I think before we begin, it's always good to set the groundwork on um, what is longevity, what is happening um, with our understanding of longevity in science and uh, in health, and uh, I think that'll set the tone for, for our discussion um, with, with Michael and Dylan. So first of all, um, the idea of longevity science is to actually target the aging process at the core level. So this is not anti-aging as you know it in terms of like face creams or Botox. This is trying to find the underlying pathways of aging target it, slow it down, and even reverse it. Um, this is not science fiction. Uh, scientists have already um, accepted as part of the scientific canon, the idea of the hallmarks of aging, um, which are the underlying drivers of, of the aging process. Uh, and these now 12 hallmarks are all being heavily researched and different methods of intervention are being made for each one of those. So one of the really great discoveries of longevity medicine is actually a way of thinking about uh, about age that is um, supported by the scientific evidence. And that's really the difference between your biological age and your numerical age. So most people, when they think about their age, they think about how old you are. You know, they look at their passport, they see the date and they say, oh, I'm this number of years old. But that's really just a time-based calculation of how old you are. Now, longevity medicine comes along and says, hey, rather than counting the days, let's actually see how biologically old you are by looking at your tissues, your organs, your DNA. There are several measures of how we could measure your biological age. And the idea is that you can be different from your numerical age. You can be biologically, physically younger than the number on your passport. You can be older. And very importantly, what we're also finding is that this biological age and the rate that everyone age, ages is flexible. Um, different lifestyles, different modifications, different interventions can make you age faster or slower at any given time. So this is a huge shift in thinking in the way that age controls who we are, how we live, um, how our health proceeds, and then ultimately how we die. Um, now, one other thing it's, that's important to note is that there's a difference between health span and lifespan. Now, lifespan is the amount of time you're alive, and to a certain extent, longevity science is interested <laughs> in extending that. But more importantly, your health span is how long you are healthy while you're still alive. So the approach that longevity medicine takes is, the, is that the physical process of deterioration is the thing that causes chronic disease. Things like Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, um, these are actually symptoms of something we know 
as aging. So rather than targeting um, or trying to develop therapeutics that treat a cancer, longevity medicine is coming around and saying, hey, why don't we prevent those things from ever starting by actually targeting the thing that's causing the other things? And that thing is aging. So it really calls into question a lot about, you know, what we think is, um, you know, the fundamental basis of what age means what in society. And with that in mind, I would like to open up to the audience and um, start talking about something that's been in the news recently, which is Madonna. Um, so before I share some videos, and then before we just we, we chat about it, right? I give my thoughts on it. Um, I, I'm sure all of you know who Madonna is. Um, if you don't, then, you know, please get in touch after this call. Uh, but um, I'd love to hear from the audience if you guys have some thoughts on, on what you've seen or what you've heard in terms of Madonna today. I mean, she is 64 years old. Um, and these are the kinds of images you'll see, whether on the media or on TikTok. Uh, on how she looks. So uh, if you could please raise your hand if you have any thoughts. I mean, I have to say, I am sure many of you have some thoughts and there's real no wrong answers here. Uh, there we go, Ellen. Um, thanks so much. I personally believe that Every individual has a choice, and I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. um, however, I, I get I, I have mixed feelings about what she's doing, but who am I to judge? That's that's all I can say. Thanks. Great, great, uh, Julie. Um, I I was quite surprised to see her. She was unrecognizable almost to me, and. It's, I, you know, I understand everybody likes to chase the holy grail of youth, but at the same time, when it changes your outward persona so much, is it really worth it? I mean, that's just my opinion. But. Okay, yeah. And Corby, I see your hand up. Uh, and then I'm just going to show a few videos for those who, who aren't familiar with what's happened recently at the Grammys. But Corby, uh, do you want to make sure. some Sure. Can you hear me, Simon? Yeah. All right, awesome. So I've actually seen Madonna live three times. Uh, not that I'm a Madonna huge fan, but um, having seen her three times over the last 10 years, so not, you know, back in the heyday of the 80s or the 90s, but recently uh, she puts on one heck of a show that's that's beyond what most artists are capable of. And it's very much, the energy is very much that of a 20 or 30 year old. Um, and the interesting part about it is that I, I don't know what the next tour is going to be. I'm not going to be part of that. Um, but it's almost as though her her mental age or her uh, showmanship age is still right where it was. Um, and I guess, you know, through current intervention, she's just trying to hold on to that um, with whatever tools are are still there. But her mind still seems to be very much. Uh, in that space. So it's it's unfortunate that the tech and the science hasn't yet quite caught up to where her mind is at. Um, but it's like they say, you know, um, uh, everybody feels like a 20 year old until they hang out with 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, no, she's a phenomenal performer. Uh, just it's um, yeah, that's that's that. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Corby. Um, yeah. And then and then for those who, who don't know, I'm just gonna, uh, I think I'm just gonna share this one video. We'll watch it for a couple minutes. Um, it is not on Monday. The first day that we signed up for monday.com, our department was already able to connect our processes. Madonna is the talk of the town once again, but not all the talk is very nice as fans voice their thoughts about the iconic singer's latest look. Madonna has long been known as the queen of pop, and the 64-year-old singer continues to turn heads with every public appearance. Madonna has accumulated a long list of head-turning moments since her heyday and has never been shy about courting controversy, even when that means starting fights with other celebs. I suppose in a sense it gets frightening to people to think that you could 
have that kind of energy and power and stay. As just one example, Madonna once had a public spat I'm with Ben Affleck on. at those on social media Cent, with there the two go. feuding about her online presence. 50 Cent roasted Madonna for posting sexy photos on social media, saying that he hoped her kids didn't have to take the pics for her. And 50 Cent isn't the only one who's had problems with Madonna's public persona. She's also <laughs> attracted attention from people calling her out for changing her looks with cosmetic procedures. And the 2023 Grammys were just the latest example of the trend. When Madonna hit the red carpet for this year's awards show, she got called out yet again for looking a lot different than how she looks on Instagram. Generally speaking, the 2023 Grammy Awards were a big deal for Madonna. Not only did she announce the 40th anniversary of her celebration tour, but she also praised artists like herself, who are known for courting dissent. Before Sam Smith took the stage, Madonna spoke to the crowd about the virtue of causing a ruckus. She said, so here Here's what I've learned after four decades in music. If they call you shocking, scandalous, troublesome, problematic, provocative, or dangerous, you're definitely onto something. But this message was largely lost on people, apparently thanks to the noise about Madonna's altered look. Frankly, people were pretty mean about it. One Twitter user summed up their reaction by writing, me attempting to ignore the fact that Madonna has a whole new face. Another said, if they didn't announce that was Madonna, I'd have no idea who this person presenting at the Grammys was. Another added, I wish Madonna would have loved herself enough to let herself age gracefully. But the backlash... Okay, that's where we'll stop it. Um, I've got a few questions to the crowd. What is it what does it mean to age gracefully? Ellen, your hand is still up. So well, I guess I better say something. Um, so I'm a, I'm a 66-year-old woman. Um, to age gracefully for me is accepting that this is part of my life cycle. Um I do struggle with appearance and I have honestly thought about would I ever want to go and do any plastic surgery at this point I'm saying no because I feel aging is a part of my lifespan so I think if people can just accept that to begin with I think it's a place to start so I I have a I have a my follow up question is um Given that we know, or given that we can start to think about aging as something that's problematic, I mean, you know, one of the difficulties with longevity science and the idea of longevity and the way that it it, it interacts with the public is that there is this idea of aging gracefully, um, that we should accept aging, uh, and that we turned it into a virtue because there's nothing that we can do about it. But when you look at aging, it's actually a process that you know take can take a lot from people, um, especially when you look at the way that it um, can trigger disease and make you frail. Um, so I think one of the difficulties or one of the questions we're going to have going forward as longevity medicine becomes more profound in the way that it creates interventions is: Are we going to rethink? how we think about, um, about aging and aging gracefully or this idea of aging gracefully do, is, is accepting it necessarily something that we should do. Um, my, my next question to the crowd is, um, do you feel that a 64 year old person should look like a 64 year old person and if so, what should a 64 person, 64 year old person look like? Uh, I see an A, Mayhew. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I'm kind of committed to the idea that people should have the bodies they want to have. Like if you're born and assigned one way, maybe you should be allowed to be something other than what you're assigned. And if you have, um, the you know the the effects of the buildup of damage over time makes you look one way maybe you should be allowed to look some other way if that's what you'd prefer
Okay, great, great. So I think, um, and and what I didn't show, the two other videos were um, some strong reactions from from people like Kevin Hart, uh, really saying quite hurtful comments about about what she looks like. I guess my last question to you guys, and this is going to be a segue into into my introduction to Michael, um, but I'd I'd like to ask the crowd if if you guys can give a kind of working definition of ageism. What is ageism? Uh, what do we mean by it? Uh, how, how does it manifest? Can someone just give like a, a little summary of what ageism could mean? All right, uh, A. Matthew. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Um, expecting people to conform to your preconceived expectations of what an old person is like. Um, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Right. I think that's that's. I mean, there's many definitions, um, and I think, again, bringing it back to longevity medicine, as as the science continues inexorably, um, when people do have a lot more agency than they do today over the aging process, the question is, how are we going to be able to treat? Uh, sorry, how are we? going to engage with these people? How are we going to see them? There's going to be a tremendous sort of public conversation around what is okay and what is not. And whether people, you know, like what Madonna has done to her face or thinks it looks good, um, I think one of the things that we can all agree fundamentally is that she's taken agency over, over who she is and what she looks like. Um, and if, someone was 25 doing the exact same things today, no one would have a problem about it. Um, but when the medicine allows us to do this type of things, if that day happens, when that day happens, um, we're gonna have to change the way we think. So with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce our two amazing speakers. Um, Michael Hoden is CEO, CEO of the Global Coalition on Aging, um, not to bring up age, um, I don't know his biological age, but he has been um, on the front line of healthcare and aging since before I was born, um, and has, has been a, a, world, a real thought leader talking across the public and private sector on issues of healthy aging, ageism, um, I mean, you name it. So we're really delighted to have Michael uh, here today. Um, next, we have Dylan Livingston, um, someone who uh, is, has, is the founder of the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives. Um, Dylan will tell you more about his, his incredible work, but his focus really is on thinking about politics and the laws that define how our systems treat aging and longevity, and this whole new field of science that looking that's looking into targeting aging potentially as a disease. Um, of course, laws are are influenced by the way people think, but they also influ influence the structures of how we're able to um, conduct medicine. And so, Dylan's work is 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 extremely important. Um, and he'll talk about that. Uh, really quickly before we start, I wanna also thank our amazing team at the Oxford Society of Aging and Longevity, of course, our speakers and our headline partner, NetMind Life. One of the questions we get a lot is, okay, I'm interested in longevity. What can I do today um, to age healthfully? Um, and uh, netmind.life is putting a whole cornucopia of resources together that really target fantastic lifestyle and behavioral modifications that you can implement today and learn more about those. If you scan that QR code, um, you'll go to their website and uh, there'll be lots of resources there and in the coming months that you'll be able to um, get. So without much further ado, I will stop. Um, Michael, uh, if you will please tell us about you and your work. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Simon, and uh, hello to everyone else. Uh, maybe I'll just open with a few thoughts about this aging topic uh, to perhaps provide a framework and through that uh, a little bit of background on what this animal of Global Coalition on Aging is and how it kind of links. Uh, so number one, um, we think of this aging demographic topic of having two basic parts. One is our longevity, but the second is population aging. Longevity is how long we're living, 
And now as a result of the miracle of basically 20th century and early 21st century, essentially medicine, uh, but a few other elements like sanitation uh, and related to medicine, uh, childhood vaccination, uh, we now have long lives. Long lives like never before in the history of humanity. Uh, and you can measure it in many ways uh, in places across the OECD countries, which of course include the UK, but also the United States, Japan, et cetera. Uh, average lifespans are now in our 80s and they'll be moving toward 100 pretty quickly. Uh, you're sitting there not too far from London. One of my better uh, data points uh, from someone uh, about 10 years ago is that a young girl or boy, but women tend to live longer than men, at least as of now. A young girl born in the mid to late 90s in London is likely to see three centuries. You will have been born, and some of you may be uh, partaking in this, um, you know, 90, 1996, 97, uh, living through the 20th century and given the likelihood of the longevity we now have achieved, you will see uh, the 22nd century. I mean, this is something that we've never even contemplated in the history of humanity. That's a big deal. And uh, as you said, uh, Simon, what we wanna do is as much as possible, move that longevity to a healthy longevity. No one wants to be you know, lying around or whatever one, one does with Alzheimer's or ter terrible cardiovascular disease or fragility fractures from osteoporosis, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, into their 80s and 90s and have a really shitty life. Um, so we do want a healthy longevity. And I think we're gonna get there largely through innovation. We can come back to that. Uh, but the second part of this aging topic is what we refer to as population aging. Po population aging. And that's the percentage of old to young in a society. And that's more a function or a result of uh, the stunningly low birth rates, probably most on this uh, Zoom call are uh, involved in uh, that your generation uh, is having. Uh, we, we are not making babies any longer the way we did. Uh, you can put a value judgment on that good, bad or indifferent, but it's the fact. Uh, and the extreme cases are places like Japan uh, where there are uh, population aging, their longevity challenges are not so much living longer, but it's the low birth rate. So 2.0 is replacement, it takes two of us to make a baby. We can do it in different scientific ways today than we might have when I was a child, but um, still uh, we think in terms of uh, 2.0 as replacement. And in every OECD country with, as I say, Japan at the leading edge of that, uh, there are now like under 1.2, 1.1 uh, babies per mother. And that's resulting in uh, a complete transformation from a societal point of view, which is very different than the longevity issue. And it also has the greater impact on public policy. So whether it's the national health uh, system in the UK, our Medicare in the United States, the health system in Japan, those policies or programs that were invented in the 1940s or 60s, or even into the 70s and 80s are completely unsustainable and unworkable for 21st century age demographics. Again, Japan being the leading edge of this, you will have uh, in a few years, roughly 40% of Japanese population over 60. Think about that for a second. That means that if we, keep 20th century ideas about work and retirement, which is basically retire when you're 60 or 65, or in many cases like France, 55, um, it is economic growth is completely unsustainable. So when you think about aging, um, there is the longevity piece and there is the population piece. The population piece, piece in my uh, estimation is much more challenging and much more difficult than longevity. And I often like to suggest that if all we had were a lot of old people, we could solve for that. 
But when you have these two pieces of this demographic framework, it becomes a huge challenge. And that's one of the reasons we created the Global Coalition on Aging, because we wanted to bring in a few select companies. Our model is to have a relatively small number of global companies, but absolutely cross-sector and cross-discipline. So an Intel or a Philips with a Novartis or a Pfizer, with a Bank of America, a Home Instead, and Uber, all of which would have an interest in this topic of aging. First and most importantly, because they can make more money on the basis of it. In the case of a Pfizer, it's gonna be because there's a new Alzheimer's medicine or osteoporosis. In the case of an Uber, it's gonna be because they see this marketplace in an older population. In the case of a Phillips, it's literally strategically transforming the company, which they did about six, seven years ago, from essentially a light bulb and appliance company to a digital health technology company. Philips likes to say that they were the largest producer of light uh, on the planet next to the sun. They got out of that business because they saw the future and the future was through this lens of aging. Uh, we have about a 17 to $20 trillion silver economy. It's the third largest economy on the planet, if you think of you know, economic units, which we normally measure in terms of geography, the United States, Japan, China, et cetera. Uh, if you're a, an entrepreneur or a company and thinking about how you can make revenue or how you can increase your position in the marketplace, uh, putting you through the lens of aging is an interesting strategy. Just like there might be a strategy to invest in China because there are 1.2 or 1.4 billion people. That's a marketplace that almost any global company, I mean, today's political environment makes it a little bit more challenging, but in principle, any global company would think about investing in that kind of environment. Uh, so we work with uh, governments, we work with companies, uh, we work with global institutions. As many of you will know, we are at a moment of uh, inflection uh, because of the uh, demographic realities. Uh, the United Nations has now articulated the decade of healthy aging. Uh, it's being implemented by the WHO, but there are many other parts of the UN system that are working on it. And if you go back to this economic element and you think of both America and essentially Western Europe, uh, including, I'll, I'll count UK and Europe for these purposes, uh, you, you have roughly 70% of all disposable income are held by people 60 and over. So if you're thinking about a business strategy, why wouldn't you think about that kind of demographic as an opportunity, a market opportunity? And then if you go from there, you begin to have an interest in a healthier aging because you keep the marketplace alive and well. So in our minds, it all connects. It's economically and marketplace driven. At the cornerstone of it is innovation, which we think will lead to a healthier and more active aging for all of us. So I'll stop there. Th thank you so much, uh, Michael. I've got a couple of questions for you, which I'll hold off, but I think in short, I think one thing is clear, you know, a coordinated effort between the public and private sector is, is so essential. Um, and we can't take a, a siloed view towards looking at, at this rapidly change, changing landscape. Um, and so your work is really pivotal in that sense, but I'll have some questions for you on that topic after. Um, I guess moving to our next speaker, Dylan, um, who, whose work really um, focuses on the political front in America, um, Dylan, we'd love to hear from you a bit about your work. Uh, if you could tell us about what is the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives? Um, how did it start? Uh, what are some of the initiatives that you're involved in? What's the future for it? Um, I'm, I'm sure we'd all love to we'd all love to learn more. So over to you, Dylan. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Michael, it was nice to, it was nice to meet you and uh, be on this panel with you and all of you in the audience uh, listening. Thanks for come and listen to us. Um, so yeah, we're the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives. We're a 501c4 nonprofit organization uh, focused on advocating for the longevity biotech industry uh, and the longevity movement in general um, at, at, a, at a political and you know generally a societal level. 
Um, you guys are actually catching me on a good day today uh, because yesterday we uh, uh, accomplished our main goal uh, that we uh, set out to achieve in, in the founding of this organization, uh, or our first main goal, which is uh, creating a caucus in the uh, House of Representatives uh, in the U.S. So uh, we made that announcement yesterday. Uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, publicity on it. It's it's a big deal. Um, so before I get into that, which I definitely will, um, I'll kind of give a background on the organization, our mission. You know what? Uh, you know how we formed. Uh, you know how I got in this field. Um, so uh, I've been aware. I, you might have seen my bio. I, I consider myself a son of the aging biotech revolution. And I, I, I think I coined that term. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. Maybe I heard from someone, but uh, it, it fits, right? I, I've been aware of this space since I was a 10-year-old, um, you know, learning about, you know, aging biology from people like Aubrey de Grey and David Sinclair. Uh, you know, I was absolutely fascinated, right? I mean, I think when you see that beard as a 10-year-old of Aubrey, you're like, this guy definitely cured aging. Like, how did he not, you know? Um, so, you know, being, being the 10-year-old I was, I, you know, got interested in the space, right? But growing up, you know, you being a, being a, you know, 10 to 20, you're not really thinking about aging, right? You're thinking about, you know, passing your math test. So it kind of, you know, buried to the back of my mind there uh, until uh, COVID hit, right? And uh, uh, I, I I moved, well, my grandfather moved in with my family, right? When COVID hit, we were in uh, the state of New York. And uh, as many of you might know, New York was really hit hard in the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, kind of watching him go through, you know, the loss of his friends and, you know, the loss of his freedom as a, you know, an individual kind of terrified me, right, uh, of what's to come in the future. And, you know, just that general feeling of accepting your fate uh, when, you know, he was presented with the disease that if I, you know, got as a 22 year old at the time, I would have, you know, most likely completely beat. So uh, that's how I get COVID is what got me back into this space. Um, and politically, I've been involved in the uh, political side of, uh, you know, well, not longevity. I've, I've been involved in politics since uh, 2016. Uh, I went to Haverford College right outside of Philadelphia, uh, one of the uh, suburbs outside. Um, and in 2016, uh, I'm sure as many of you know, Donald Trump was elected and uh, the uh, uh, ensuing uh, backlash by the Democrats in the uh, Pennsylvania Southeast area. Uh, you know, I was kind of swept up in all that. Uh, I worked for the Democrats 2018, 2019. And then uh, in 2020, I worked for uh, the Biden uh, campaign in, in rural Pennsylvania. Um, and it was at this time, uh, obviously COVID came around. It was at this time when uh, I, I kind of came to the realization that this industry, this, you know, this new uh, industry uh, that that uh, it, it needed political advocacy at, you know, at, at the most basic level, right? It, it needed some entity to do, uh, you know, to have a, to, to, to present a unified message to Congress and to do basic actions that, you know, any industry does. And you know, I looked at uh, like the NRA uh, for, for inspiration, you know, maybe not, maybe, maybe not like, they're not like the best example for this because what they're doing is advocating for stuff that kills people and we're not. Anyways, I digress. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of industry organizations that are set up as specifically this type of nonprofit of 501c4. So I, I, I looked around and I realized this is, you know, uh, there's advocacy and in, in, in all these other spaces and, you know, the Alzheimer's, uh, you know, advocacy industry and in the cancer advocacy industry, the American Cancer Society. So I realized that there were the, all these organizations advocating for specific initiatives. And I realized that, you know, A4LI needed to exist. So uh, I've, I've been on this mission now for about two years. Uh, first year was, you know, meeting people in the longevity industry. Uh, we got the organization publicized and, you know, uh, launched last January. Uh, and since then, our main goal has been to get this longevity caucus uh, that I mentioned that we just got done yesterday uh, off the ground. So we uh, uh, in 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 March of 2022, I, I met with uh, Congressman Paul Tonko, who is the Democratic co-chair of the caucus. Uh, then uh, he, he was our first person to kind of agree and see the value in this. Right. Uh, and then over the uh, last six months, about uh, A4LI has been going to various offices on the Hill, uh, you know, making the case for a, a caucus, the value of it, and, you know, what can be done to kind of change uh, the future of healthcare in America. Um, I'm sure many of you know, there's really compelling arguments, you know, beyond just the moral side of this to, you know, pursue longevity medicine, right? Uh, Michael, you, you, you kind of 
touched on it a bit, but you know, the, the older our population gets, uh, you know, average age wise. And, you know, the, the, the other big thing you know, that I'm seeing is also the shrinkage of population, right? I think China this year was uh, for the first time in the last 40 or 50 years has, has had a population decrease, right? So that, that's something to be aware of, you know, Japan is kind of on that same trajectory as well. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, is, is a result it, it, it is caused by aging, right. And, and this whole, uh, aging population. So, um, Anyway, so I, I digress there for a moment. Let me get back on track here. Um, so the, uh, the, the, uh, the 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 caucus uh, is Paul Tonko, uh, Gus Bill Arrakis from Florida, uh, Dan Crenshaw and Michael Burgess from Texas and Anna Eshoo from San Francisco area. Um, it's, it's a really high quality group of uh, Congress people, uh, four of the five, uh, including both including both the uh, co-chairs are on the prestigious Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, and uh, the fifth, Michael Burgess, is he's not, but he is uh, the co-chair of the GOP Doctors Caucus. So really some high quality, influential, impactful Congress people who have chosen to make this their, uh, you know, their their thing. Right. Uh, so it's really quite exciting. Um, once, we, you know, our, our first big thing that we're looking to do after we get, you know, after we. Well, I guess now we have the caucus together. Our first big thing we're trying to do now is is get a briefing uh, put together. So we'll be doing that sometime in April. Uh, that'll be a private briefing, most likely for the members. But we'll be going in depth with all the members, the staffers, and you know, select few uh, other uh, members on different committees uh, and explain in depth, you know, uh, the the biology of aging and the value behind all of this. Um, and it, so, so we we are we are also uh, pushing for two other initiatives that I want to I want to touch on. Um, the first is we're we're actively working on a white paper to outline a piece of legislation to create an approval pathway uh, for longevity biotech therapeutics and drugs uh, in the FDA. So uh, this idea, I, I, I was inspired by the uh, RMAT pathway that was established in 2016 under the Cures Act. And basically what that was, was the FDA recognizing that regenerative medicine uh, uh, had has a, has a role to play in the future of healthcare. Um, and, you know, they want regenerative medicine, cell and gene therapy companies, you know, tissue reengineering, things like that. Um, you know, those kind of companies that are pursuing that to have, you know, uh, an easier time getting their drugs to, to market. Right. And so there needs to be something similar for longevity medicine. Um, and that's what we're, uh, you know, going to be working on, uh, you know, creating over the next couple of months. And, and, and uh, I guess, you know, hopefully not, hopefully not more than a couple of months. Hopefully we get this done sooner than a couple of months. Um, and so we'll be releasing that in the next uh, couple of weeks. And then the other thing we're we're actively pushing right now, uh, and this is something that is is is, is new, but it's very exciting. Um, the state of the state of Montana uh, has a president uh, of their state senate who is uh, very interested in the longevity biotech uh, mission and the industry, um, and uh, is interested in you know uh, seeing what they can do at a state level to help this industry move forward. So. Uh, there is currently legislation uh, in the Montana state legislator uh, legislature that uh, is being debated right now um, that is focused on expanding right to try and access to, uh, to, to you know, to, to longevity medicine specifically, but, you know, all, all types of drugs. Um, you know, the idea, uh, 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 you know, states are supposed to be kind of the, you know, the laboratory of democracy, right? You know, it's kind of figure out which laws work, uh, which laws work, which laws don't. Um, and so, you know, before we, you know, do anything at a national scale, it, it would be nice to kind of get a test uh, in, in one of these states. So Montana is looking like it's that, that it's going to be the state, um, and there is a, a piece of legislation around uh, right to try uh, that is currently being debated. So those are the three big things we're doing right now. Um, the last thing I'll just mention is uh, we're, we're looking to also obviously get more funding for research at a governmental level. That's, uh, you know, uh, paramount, but, you know, I think, um, just with the political climate right now, especially with a split Congress, right. I think the odds of that are rather low. Um, what we are doing though, you know, instead of trying to get more money for the NIH, uh, we're, we're looking toward ARPA H. Um, I'm not sure if the audience is, uh, familiar with that, uh, that, that acronym or that agency, but basically it's, it's DARPA for healthcare initiatives, um, and in the stated, uh, if, you, if you go to the U.S. government's website about ARPH, the stated goal of the agency is to uh, fund the highest risk, highest reward biomedical research endeavors. And, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious to me, and I'm sure all of you, that longevity and aging biotech is the, the, the highest reward biomedical research endeavor, right? So uh, ARPH is really where a lot of this research should be housed. Uh, and so we're going to be advocating with, you know, the, the, the new director was just announced in the last few months. We'll be working with her. 
Um, and it's really quite exciting. There's a lot of things that can and will be done. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of time and uh, effort. But, you know, I, I can guarantee you that we at A4LI are, you know, pushing every day to, to get this stuff done as soon as possible. Because at the end of the day, this is a race against time, right? I mean, you, um, uh, Michael mentioned that, uh, you know, um, what would you say? People in uh, the born in the nineties have a chance to live three centuries. I, I want to be, you know, I was born in 98. I would love to, you know, be that, but you know, it's not going to happen if we're, we're just sitting on our hands, we have to be proactive and, you know, actually try to, you know, create the future we want to see. Right. So um, we're working every day and, you know, we, we, we need all your help, right. We need the longevity industries buy into this kind of mission, uh, you know, uh, around getting political activism and advocacy at the forefront. So I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dylan. Um... I, I have a couple of questions for, oh, and by the way, Dylan, congratulations. Uh, now I know why you said, you. you know, let's wait until I have some good news to share. Yes. Um, well, it turned out that it was going to be the day before, you know, it, it turned out perfect. Perfect. It turned out perfectly. perfect. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions, but Dylan, I'm, I'm actually going to start with you. Um, it, it would be helpful if maybe you can expand on why does longevity biotech need representation? You know, you know what 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 is it that they actually need? And maybe you could, you know, for for some members of our audience, um, you know, if you could maybe touch on the idea of uh, you know aging as a classification for a disease and sort of what barriers are, exist for longevity biotech in particular um, that require um, a change in our our legal system and maybe how that relates to. Um, moral and ethical opinions around aging, like sort of the interplay between those? Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, political advocacy is important for any sort of new, I mean, I, I don't want to call this a fringe industry, industry because I'm a part of it, but like, you know, it, it, not many people know about longevity and aging biotech. It, it's, it's something that's still, you know, kind of unknown. Um, and you know, there, there are examples of the past that you can, you can look to like, uh, nanotechnology in the early two thousands, you know, that was a brand new field that needed advocacy and, you know, it took time, but ultimately the nano, na the, the national nanotech initiative was passed in 2004. And that was the result of hard work. Uh, and that investment by the government was the result of political advocacy. Right. Um, the, the other one I'm thinking about is, you know, uh, uh, Nixon's, uh, war on cancer, right. You know, that, that, that was the result of, you know, public advocacy campaigns, uh, the Jimmy Fund, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's necessary, uh, you know, especially with something that people don't know about to, to, to be active at a governmental level. So, so you know, people look at their politicians, people look at what their politicians are talking about and doing, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feedback. You want to get the constituents of a district talking, so the politicians hear it and vice versa, right? So we're kind of taking this top-down approach, getting politicians to talk about it so we can change the minds that way. But you touched on the, you know, the aging as a disease and the regulatory um, effort. You know, th there are a lot of companies right now that are, you know, I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but you know, maybe 120 longevity biotech companies in the US, right, that are operating under these rules that, you know, have been laid out for the last 50 years. Um, and that's why we're trying, you know, so, so we don't want to necessarily, and the other, you know, part of that is, you know, the whole biomarker issue, I don't think there's any consensus, you know, definitely not within the FDA, but, you know, even in the community on which biomarkers are, you know, valid and which ones aren't, right. And so that's still a work in progress. And so until that really comes along, uh, you know, aging as a disease isn't plausible. And so that's why we're trying to make this pathway, right? This, this pathway for existing companies to take so that they don't A, have to change up their whole business model and their all their clinical trials, right? That they spend millions of dollars doing. But also, you know, that we're not ready for aging as a disease, in my opinion, at least. And I think in the opinion of the FDA and, you know, what this will do, the more companies that we get into this pathway, the more companies that are, you know, talking with the FDA and FDA officials regularly, which is what this pathway will allow, the more likely we can find some solution to this biomarker problem, right? So that's that's what we're trying to get done there. Um, and then, you know, research, right? And funding, there's, you know, there's, we spend what, $52 billion at the NIH every year and 300, 400 million goes to the, you know, gero science. It's, it's a gross misallocation of funds, especially considering 70% of deaths are age-related or aging-related. So, um, you know, I, I think, I, I think that's, you know, and, and that's so basic, right. But, you know, it, it's just a tough time to get that done, the, 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 that kind of money uh, moved around. But um, the regulatory thing I'm really excited about, because that, that's, that's, a, that's a no, you know, that, that that's, that's a little easier, because you don't have to convince anybody to like write a check for anything, right. It's just, you know, changing some language here and there. So 
uh, yeah, we're, I think the regulatory uh, efforts will be uh, fruitful. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, my next question is for Michael. Um, I think, you know, thinking about how different sectors are, are engaging with this, um, there's probably a debate on what's more important. Is the private sector, is the public sector more important to get on board with, with the rapidly changing um, environment and landscape we're living in around aging? But you mentioned, Michael, these, the, you know, several private sector examples of uh, of work in the aging field. And then you 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 mentioned some innovations. Um, sort of it's a two-part question. One, you know, where do you think is the most, like if you wanted to place your bets or you wanted to think about where you put your effort, you know, public versus private sector on getting the most return um, for your investment of time and, and, and effort, um, where do you think uh, is the most interesting kind of, um, changes in, in this landscape or, or is able to make the, the biggest impact. And then you mentioned, um, you mentioned innovations uh, in sort of uh, private sector, uh, healthy aging. And I, I, I'd be curious to hear some of your favorite examples of, um, of companies that have done really, really interesting things as sort of case studies um, for other people to think about um, what can be done in the private sector? Uh, very complicated and multi-pronged question. So I'll kind of take the liberty of uh, riffing on it. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, so um, firstly, congratulations, Dylan, to uh, the successes you're having politically. Uh, I, of the names you mentioned, I'm, I don't know him personally, but I've been a great fan of Congressman Crenshaw. So Anything he's doing is fantastic. Um, so, you know, to your first point, and you kind of said it right after I spoke, Simon, uh, public or private, it's a trick question. It has to be both. Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to get the great innovations out of the private sector, whether it's uh, new digital health technology, uh, you know, really re dealing with transportation or housing issues, um, the uh, connected home, shall we say, uh, or new medicines uh, that uh, Dylan was alluding to uh, for the diseases of aging or even to address through the geroscience framework itself. Uh, it is true that um, the only model we have ever and to this day where you're able to actually get the innovations um, in the market and scaled in a way that's helpful around the country or around the world um, is through the pharmaceutical companies. So you can get a lot of basic research done at NIH or the equivalent in the UK or Japan or different European countries, um, but uh, getting those innovations uh, to the market and scaled uh, has always been a function of the private sector. And I see no reason to think that's going to change. Uh, the um, and and the market will determine that. Uh, and to your point, Dylan, uh, you know you have this uh, growing uh, marketplace uh, defined by population aging, uh, where uh, people will look at that, and that's where they'll place their bets, uh, their economic bets. Uh, so, you know, I think to your point about um, some of the interesting examples, switching gears completely, uh, about 10 years ago, Bank of America, uh, mainly with its U.S. operations, although it has some in the U.K. and Japan that it was looking at, uh, started doing research into this topic of the longevity economy, as they called it and discovered that this was central to their business model, particularly with respect to A, the retirement business, the time around 09, 10, they uh, were actually forced to buy Merrill Lynch, uh, you know, after that, the fiscal crisis of that time, but also the 401k plans that they manage for something like over 65% of the American population through uh, their companies. And they started looking at um, elements like spending benefits for elder caregiving. So 
many companies, including Bank of America, but many across the United States, UK, Europe, especially, uh, put in childcare benefits 35, 40 years ago. They're now saying what we did for childcare, we wanna keep, we wanna expand, but let's do it for elder care. Um, a, a second good example is uh, you know, what they did in creating a whole program on healthcare education for their portfolio managers because their research told them that, and this was in a time of low interest rates, we're now moving a little bit differently, so it may change a little, but where people said, you know, I'm not really worried as much for you ma to manage my money to give me a return. I wanna know how you're gonna work with me on my most important concerns like healthcare, which turned out to be 70% of all the responses and 50% of that was people worried about Alzheimer's. So they started, Bank of America started spending a lot of time and effort in that space. Another example um, is a guy named Paul Hogan, who back in the late 90s, right when you were uh, born, Dylan, I guess, uh, created what is now Home Instead. Uh, it took this horrible, uh, you know, model of warehousing older people. I remember visiting my great grandparents when I was very young uh, in, the, in Queens and it was just awful, uh, you know, to bring caregiving to the home. Uh, they did it through the franchise model. They became the most successful global company. They were bought about a year and a half ago by a technology company called um, Honor. Uh, Seth Sternberg created this thing. Uh, and they're now applying technology to home care, not only to help out in how you manage caregiving, but even more interestingly, the efficiency of the caregiving process itself, which is probably one of the most inefficient models we have today. Um, and then you look at the pharma companies and you're getting huge advances in, um, you know, we haven't quite gotten there yet with Alzheimer's. I'm confident we will, but to your point, Dylan, we don't have the biomarkers, uh, but certainly the, the progress we've made in oncology, uh, the progress we have in osteoporosis and uh, fragility fractures, diabetes are very enormous. And the last point I'll make is simply going back again to your point of a zero science. I sit on the board of the organization that's probably been in that space the most um, extensively, the American Federation on Aging Research. You probably know Nir Barzilai, Jim McClellan from Mayo and others. And they are now working on, uh, you know, with one of the old diabetes medicines, metformin, on how that might arrest the aging process. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a lot of progress. The best uh, scientific research in that space came out of Japan. A lot of um, peer reviewed journals that reflected it. Uh, and I think, you know, in the next several years, we're going to see the results. Well, thank you, Michael. You went from just riffing to my uh, question to, to providing the perfect response. Um, Guys, we have we we don't have much more time, but I'd like to open up to the audience for questions. Um, so, if anyone has some questions, please raise your hand for either speaker. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and actually choose a question from the chat because there's quite a lively discussion. Um, uh, Ali asked, why is aging a disease? It's stating that pregnant, it's like stating that pregnancy is a disease. Wanting healthy aging is no different to wanting a healthy pregnancy. They're both physiological processes. So why turn aging into a pathological process? Yeah, so let me jump in because Dylan, you spoke to that. And um, I mean, that is a, a double-edged sword to put it mildly. And what's the name of the person who put that in the chat? I'm oh, sorry. Ali. Allie. Allie, I think your point is exactly right. And Dylan, I probably disagree with you on this one. Um, while I want the kind of science and medicine and progress that you're looking for, um, I'd like to try to achieve it without going to the secondary point of sociologically calling aging a disease, because I totally agree. Um, you know, aging is a risk factor for many diseases from osteoporosis to Alzheimer's. 
Uh, and we also know through geroscience to what you, the point you made, Dylan, that rather than thinking about these diseases that keep piling on top of themselves as we age, are there some underlying conditions like inflammation uh, that lead to uh, these problems uh, overall as one ages? Um, that's a very different point in my judgment than calling it a disease, which I think is a huge mistake. Uh, because to Ali's point, you can't get away from the sort of political and sociology, you, you, you win the battle, but lose the war. I think what we have to do is find a way to make the progress that I think you're looking for, Dylan. Um, and we're, we're, we are making a lot of progress and there are a lot of the elements there without going to that step of calling aging a disease. Uh, that, I never called I, it. I, I never called aging a disease. I just said that you know that that's what people need in order to run clinical trials in the U.S. You need to you know, yeah, have and, disease. So that's that's the only reason. I don't know what the, the, this whole thing is about now, but I never said that. So well, and I agree with you. I agree with you. I don't know why you're saying you disagree with me or anybody is, but I, no, I well, totally agree. It's it's the, you you don't want to condemn an entire group of people to be being diseased just because of a fact of life. So I'm with you. I don't know why. Right. I don't know where to yeah, and well, I just Ali had that interpretation for for some reason, yeah. and I and she's not alone, not from you, but from many people. And you're right. In order to get the agreement, and I was part of it um, by the leadership at FDA. This is about five or six years ago to get them to support um, this these clinical trials around metformin uh, to see what impacts it might have on aging itself, rather than particular. Uh, diseases like diabetes, they insisted on looking for an indication called aging. And it, it it's a technical element. It is there. And I think it's a real problem. And the community, in my opinion, never should have agreed to that, but they did. And so it, it has to do with the weirdness of the clinical trial process and the problems with the bureaucrats, basically, at the FDA. Yeah, thank you. Um... Dylan's going to have to hop off in a minute, uh, unfortunately, um, but I'll just give some really closing remarks because it's a really important point and a distinction. Um, when we say treating aging as a disease, it doesn't mean we treat, treat aged people as if they're diseased people. Uh, it's about a, a medical classification or a way of, of targeting the aging process in the way that we would target someone who has a chest infection or a broken leg, as if, which is to say we intervene and we find ways to meddle with that process. Um, it's not, as Michael said, sociologically, um, and, it's, and this is the problem with words and the very idea of aging, it has so many connotations that it's very difficult to unpack and separate what's happening physiologically and the science um, and, and the terms and how they affect um, sort of uh, everything we understand. So um, we're, we're just at 7 p.m. Uh, I certainly feel we could have gone on, um, but we promised everyone that uh, it would end at seven. Dylan, Michael, thank you so, so much for your time. What a privilege to have you guys. Dylan, also a privilege to have you on um, really a, a historic date for, for the States and for you. So congratulations. Yeah. Well, the uh, last thing I'll say is that we took inspiration from you, uh, you UK people with the, uh, with the all party parliamentary group. So, uh, you know, props to the UK as well. You guys are leaders seriously. And what I'll, the last thing I'll say before I hop off, cause I do actually need to hop off. I have to go to a doctor's appointment speaking about longevity. Um, I, uh, the Oxford Society for uh, Longevity and Aging is something that we're trying to recreate in the U.S. also, because the idea of having a university system to, you know, a uh, university club, right, to to engage with students, you know, to, in, you know, increase the uh, amount of talent in, in, in the, you know, pool is uh, really important also if we really want to get this, uh, you know, uh, mission accomplished. So, uh, you know, you, you, you UK people, you guys got it, you know, figured out over there, right? So I'm, I'm looking towards you guys. But uh, I do need to go now. So uh, thank you guys so much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll be back on soon. Th thank you, Dylan. Thank you. Take care, guys. And Michael, I don't know if you have any, any closing remarks. Well, um, so I would just, to this last 
little bit of a debate we were having. Uh, bluntly, Simon, I don't think you can have it both ways. In today's political and communications environment, as Dylan said, and you indicated, language is critical. And um, having anything for whatever reason that allows or enables the interpretation of aging being considered a disease, which is what's happening in this space, is a challenge. And so I think we have to work much harder at uh, being very clear with our language, how we're articulating it, and uh, where we're moving from the scientific to the political worlds. Uh, in today's environment, the two are very much connected as we know from COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Um, thanks for the closing remarks. Thank you for your perspective. I would, I'd actually love to sit down and chat and, and hear about, you know, how, what, what terminology we could use. Um, there, there we, could, we could probably have a whole round table around that. I'm sure you've already had several. Uh, I wish I could have been part of. Um, but thank you everyone for your time, for joining. Um, someone, Mike Brown says, 120 years minimum, I'm not settling for less. Let's make sure those years are healthy, healthful, and nurturing, uh, most of all. Uh, so thank you all tonight, and ha have a great evening. Thank you.